Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com in Savannah, Tennessee. I hope you are all doing well. Tennessee's doing good this morning. It's a little brisk outside, but what do you expect in February? Today, we got a new collection and we, uh, actually I got a couple collections and they had some wonderful early uh, military and civilian pistols in them. There's some really cool ones, and if you get a chance, go to shilohrelics.com, check those out. Thought I would focus on one of them today, but I was going to show you a couple more before I get going in there. This collection had uh, civilian, military, all of them uh, date from the probably late 1600s on up into the mid-1830s, uh, 1840s, uh, early English flintlocks. This one's really cool. It's a brass barrel. This one was actually captured when the Yankees took over Norfolk, Virginia, and it's written on the back, the little history of it being captured when the city fell. So there's some neat ones on there. So be sure you go on and check those out. The one I'm going to focus on, though, is one that I've always liked. I've only had a couple of them because they say that there was less than a thousand of them made. Uh, it's officially known as the 1826 Flintlock for Navy that was made by the W.L. Evans Company in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. They uh, is officially known as the Model 26, but they all show up with 1830 and 1831 dates. You very rarely see them, and when you do see them, most of them were converted from the original Flintlock into percussion uh, to modernize them during the time. Um, and it's been a while since I explained that, so I'll tell you. These guns held a piece of flint, and it started the spark that would fire the powder inside the barrel. Uh, that's great, but it's not quite as dependable as the later improved version of a percussion cap. And what they did, instead of the flint starting that spark, they had a little uh, copper or brass cap that had uh, material inside of it that would spark and the hammer struck the percussion cap on top of a nipple, which is just a uh, piece of metal that channels it into the barrel and uh, caused that spark to set the fire off to fire the gun. A lot more dependable, a lot easier, not as bulky looking, and it's just a big improvement over the earlier flints. But for all of those centuries, they used uh, flint to start the gun, to start the spark to fire the gun. This one is in the original flintlock and it still works, the action still works. They have a brass pan that channels it into what they call a touch hole. And that's on the back of the barrel that channels the spark from the flint into the uh, barrel itself to cause the gun to fire. So that's a quick lesson on flintlock pistols. They only a thousand of these. Most of them are converted. So when you see one of these, it's in original flintlock condition. Man, that's a special thing. You don't see many of them that way. And at best, there was a th less than a thousand of them, according to Flaterman's guide, that were made to start with. So this one is a jewel, and it's been. Uh, it's actually still got one thing I thought was neat when I bought it. It's still got the little collector's tag on it. Uh, it came out of the collection of Dr. Joe Murphy. And Dr. Murphy had an amazing collection of weapons as well as buttons and Confederate buckles. I bought his uh, Confederate buckle collection and it was staggering what all was in it. And he, uh, he uh, had a note in his, uh, in his paperwork. He said, I want to be the most advanced collector. And he, he was. He was one of them at least. And this one was in his collection. So you know it's a quality piece. Uh, <coughs> the piece, this one has 1830 uh, behind the hammer. In front of the hammer, it has uh, U.S. and W.L. Evans. Some of them will have the Valley Forge mark, and I've always thought those were a little neater, but most of them don't. Um, the gun has the full-length barrel. Underneath the barrel, it has the sling swivel like this, and that's where your ramrod for uh, loading the gun, it held it in place, and that kept it from getting lost. It's a hell of an invention, and <laughs> Because you can imagine bouncing on horseback, that's an easy thing to lose. And this one kept right on there with it. Uh, you didn't lose it, didn't have to worry about it. They had a one-piece walnut wood stock. This one's real dark in color, and I like them when they're like that because it sets it off against the color of the metal. Uh, what makes it a navy? Because the, the gun is basically identical to the 1826 uh, uh, flintlock pistol made by Simeon North. 
what they have on the back of the stock, they have this. And what's that for? It's a belt hook. Why would a Navy pistol have a belt hook and an Army uh, uh, not? Well, it's because if you're on board ship, you're not going to need that gun all the time. They put them in racks, and you didn't have to have a holster on your side that you wore around every day. What you did, they put them on a rack when hell came, when you're ready for battle, you take that and you have a belt hook and you just put it on your belt. You don't have to have that holster full time. So those are, that's what always refer, makes them referred to as a Navy pistol rather than a standard army pistol. And this one's got that belt hook, belt hook solid as a rock. You could use it today in case you're on board ship and a bunch of pirates try to take you, you could defend yourself. This one's a pretty one. But go, if you get a chance, go onto the website at shallowrelics.com. It'll be under, um, I've actually got them listed a couple places. They'll be under non-excavated. They'll be under firearms. And there'll also be, I started a new section for colonial items because um, the relic business kind of goes in cycles. And one thing that I think, and this is my opinion, you put this with $3 and a half and you can get a Coke out of a vending machine these days. But I think flintlock pistols are way undervalued and way underappreciated because a lot of those guys that drove those prices on those up to crazy numbers have died. <laughs> and so the price on a lot of them have plummeted. Uh, this gun at one time would have brought, <laughs> wouldn't surprise me if he paid eight to $10,000 for it. You can get this for a lot less than that right now. And it's a piece that I love. I think it's cool. I've only had a few of them in 30 years, so they're not common. But go on there, they're beautiful guns. And some of them, uh, a lot of them are huge. So I've got some small ones. They're just really neat. Even if you can't buy them, go and check them out because it's fun to look and learn. That's one of the things that I love about this is getting to share uh, information with people because it's, it's, it's a great hobby and people <laughs> seem to like them. I had, we had the show last weekend in Dalton, Georgia, and so many of you came up and said, hey, man, I really enjoy those videos. And they uh, pet me up sometimes when I'm feeling down and, and they do me too. This has kind of been like my little therapy session and I appreciate y'all guys saying that and let me uh, vent and uh, say what's on my mind. And I'm, I'm just so thankful because I never would have dreamt when we started these that it would have would have helped me in so many ways and I hope it's helped some of you guys. We had uh, uh, one of the guys that, <laughs> I've got this picture. I think I'm gonna be able to find it and put it on there. So I'm gonna point to it like it's there. Uh, my buddy, Gary Robinson down in Florida, great guy. This is a picture of the first day we met. I was unloading some stuff in the middle of summer in Nashville at a show. And this guy comes up and he says, hey, young guy, you need some help. And I was hot and tired and cranky. And I said, man, I'd love it. And that was the start of my friendship with Gary Robinson. We were friends until the day he died. And uh, uh, those he could work on guns and he knew about guns and just a great guy. And he helped me so many ways that uh, I just hope somebody, somebody will look back and say, man, he helped me that way. And so I'm going to miss you, Gary, but I'm glad you ain't hurt no more. Uh, uh his, his wife always had a saying, she, she knew I, I love to eat, God, can't you tell? And she would bring me cookies to the show and she, she would say, I make these for two people. Uh, uh, how was it she worded it? Uh, people I like and people I love and I don't like you. <laughs> people I like and people I love, but I don't like you. And I thought, she never would say I love you. I'd say it all the time because hell, I don't bother me saying that. But uh, she would always say it that way. And it always meant so much to me. And so I'm glad that they are having uh, a, a cold drink today. Uh, they would fix their little coolers and go to the shows and she'd have them the sandwiches and they have the uh, bush beer. And I got, I like that too. So, uh, but Here's to you. I hope that y'all are toasting well today. I love you both. I love you guys, and I'll catch you next time. I hope you have a great day. Catch you later.